So in the last video, we encountered this quantity called the space-time interval, and we stated that it remains invariant under all Lorentz boosts and spatial rotations, but without proof. Now we've already seen why it makes sense in the case of rotations, and now we'll tackle the case of boosted reference frames. Then we'll see how this quantity defines the geometry of space-time and how notions of causality fit into this picture. So in order to prove the invariance of this interval algebraically, let's focus on the simple case where reference frame k prime moves along the x-axis to reference frame k. And of course, any arbitrary velocity vector in 3D can be reduced to this under some rotation, so this doesn't really matter that we're simplifying the situation this way. Now the more general expression for the space-time interval is delta r squared minus c delta t all squared where delta r is just the spatial distance between two events. So in 1D, this is equal to delta x squared minus c delta t all squared. Now we already have the Lorentz transformation equations for x and t, which we derived two videos ago. And now in order to find the corresponding space-time interval in k prime, which we denote i prime, all we have to do is substitute the expressions for delta x prime and delta t prime into this equation. So doing that, we get this expression, which when expanded gives us this. Now we can cancel out these terms and then group the delta t and delta x terms uh, to get this. And now if we recall the expression for gamma, then it's easy to see that this bit here is just equal to one and i prime is equal to delta x squared minus c squared delta t squared, which is just equal to i. Hence, the space-time interval in k prime is equal to the space-time interval in k, so we know that in general, a Lorentz boost will not change the value of i. Now, given the invariance of delta x squared minus c squared delta t squared, we can also assert the invariance of x squared minus c squared t squared, since this is just the space-time interval between some point xt and the origin. Now it's possible to rephrase this as x squared divided by i minus ct squared divided by i equals 1, and some of you might recognize this as the standard equation for a hyperbola centered on the origin, where the hyperbola has a north-south opening if i is less than 0, and an east-west opening if i is greater than 0, with x on the x-axis and t on the y-axis. Now, as a brief refresher on hyperbole, a hyperbolic curve is simply a set of points whose distances, the two foci, maintain the same absolute difference. Now, I won't prove any of this here, but these foci are related to constants a and b by this equation. And then these constants also define a rectangle whose corners enable us to draw the asymptotes of the hyperbola, denoted by the red lines here. Now the situation is similar with north-south opening hyperbole, except that now the foci are distributed along the y-axis, and now the signs of the x and y terms are reversed, such that the y term is positive and the x term is negative. Now it might be worth remembering that the equation has to be modified if the hyperbola is centered on some arbitrary point, hk, rather than the origin, uh, but let's not worry about that for now. So, now we have a neat geometric way of looking at the Lorentz transformations. If we have a space-time diagram with time on the y-axis, usually scaled by c, and spatial position on the x-axis, then Lorentz boosts simply move an event up and down a hyperbolic curve, as you can see on the right-hand side. This is in contrast to the so-called Galilean transformations on the left-hand side, which are the stuff of Newtonian physics, and all these do is just translate an event along the spatial axis. In fact, I think comparing these two regimes visually and geometrically is perhaps the most vivid demonstration of how Newtonian and Einsteinian physics differ fundamentally. Notice that in the Galilean transforms, the time axis is not affected at all, whereas in the Lorentz transforms, space and time are transformed in an interrelated way, which is why it makes sense to talk of some kind of interrelated space-time rather than just space and time.
Now, despite all this, these diagrams also reveal why Newtonian physics is actually a good approximation for low velocities. For if we stretch the Lorentz diagram such that it captures only small velocities, then it does look very similar to the Galileo diagram. Now, it is in fact thanks to the mathematician Hermann Minkowski that we have these space time diagrams, and this is why they are sometimes called Minkowski diagrams. Now looking at this figure, we can see that this graph is basically split into three regions, corresponding to the sine of i. As we mentioned before, if i is less than zero, then the hyperbola has a north-south opening. And if i is greater than zero, then it has an east-west opening. If i equals zero, then events are just pushed up and down the asymptotes. Now, as it turns out, the sign of the space-time interval between two events has some physical significance as well. Now, in a Minkowski diagram, the rectangle associated with the hyperbola has equal width and height. So the asymptotes follow the equation ct equals x and ct equals minus x, respectively. Now, since these lines effectively trace the path of a beam of light emitted from the origin, they essentially delineate the boundaries of the past and future light cones. So if we have some event B inside the light cone, i.e. in the north-south portion of the graph, then it can interact with some event A that is situated at the origin. Indeed, it is always possible to find some reference frame with some velocity, such that events A and B share the same position in that reference frame, the only difference being along the time axis. And so, when i is less than zero, we call this a time-like interval. Now, on the other hand, if event b lies in the east-west portion, it would lie outside the light cone, so it could not interact with event a, since nothing can travel faster than light. No matter what reference frame we choose, a and b will always be separated spatially, so we call this a space-like interval. And finally, if event B lies along the asymptote, then only a beam of light could possibly connect it with event A. So we call this a light-like interval. Now the Minkowski diagram reveals a few more interesting features, one of which is the preservation of causality. Now what do I mean by this? Well, remember back in the second video of the special relativity series, we saw how simultaneity was relative. And the consequence of this is that the ordering of events depends on your reference frame. Well, imagine that we have two events in which event A causes event B. Say someone throws a ball to someone else. So event A is the ball being thrown. Event B is the ball being caught. Now, if ordering was relative, could we find a reference frame where the ball is caught before it is thrown? Well, thankfully, the answer is no. And the reason is that between events connected by a time-like or light-like interval, in other words, between events that can be causally connected, temporal ordering is necessarily preserved. And we can see this easily in our Minkowski diagram. If event A were in the time-like region, then it could not transition from the future of event A to the past of event A, denoted by the sign of t. If it were in the space-like region, then it could do just that, but this would have no implications for causality, since event A and event B could not influence each other anyway. So in our example with the ball, it's clear that events A and B are connected by a time-like interval. Now this analysis can be applied to the case of the rays of light as well. So here, event A is the light being emitted, and events B and C are the rays hitting the back and front of the train, respectively. Now from the perspective of event A, events B and C occur at the same time. And this won't change if we just perform a spatiotemporal translation such that event C sits at the origin. Now from this perspective, it's clear that event B lies in the space-like region. So while the ordering of, of events can be switched, this presents no problems for causality, since events B and C cannot directly influence each other. So that's just a quick breakdown of Minkowski's concept of space-time, and it provides a nice geometric interpretation of some of the concepts that we've explored before. 
And as it turns out, these space-time diagrams will prove useful as we go forward for special relativity. For example, in the next video, where we take a look at the relativistic addition of velocities.